In this lecture, we are going to begin talking about matrices. Previously, we talked about arrays, specifically one-dimensional arrays. Whereas we can think of one-dimensional arrays as vectors, we can think of two-dimensional arrays as matrices. Now, because there are actually tons of things you can do with matrices, this is going to be a very quick demo of a few essentials. So keep in mind that this isn't all there is to matrices in NumPy, and you can apply this kind of thinking to the rest of the course as well. First, let's start with the fact that there is an actual object in NumPy called matrix, but this is not recommended to use. Basically, a matrix, by definition, must be two-dimensional, whereas a NumPy array can be any dimensional, whether that's one, two, three, or more. So if you ever see a matrix out in the wild, you should probably convert it to an array first before you do any processing. One exception to that is sparse matrices in SciPy, but that's a story for another day. So let's start by putting on our programming hats again and think about if we were not using NumPy, how would we represent a matrix? So typically in your computer science 101 class, this would be represented by an array of arrays or in the case of Python, a list of lists. So let's make a simple matrix. Let's say L equals one, two, three, four. And let's print L. So this is a two by two matrix where the first row is one, two, and the second row is three, four. The first thing we want to figure out is array access. So how do I get the value at row zero, column one, for example? Since this is a list of lists, I can first do L of zero to get the first row of L. So that gives me one, two, the first row of L. Note that by convention, we say that the rows come first and then the columns. So now that we have L zero, which is the entire row of the matrix L, we can do L of zero of one to get the element at column one from this row. Okay, and that gives us two. Of course, this makes sense because L of zero is a list so I can access it just like I would any other list. Let's now see how we can do this in NumPy. Now, as you might have noticed earlier, in order to initialize a NumPy array, I passed in a list. So it should make sense that I would be able to do the same thing here. So I can do a equals np.array. I pass in the same list as before. So one and two, three, four. And let's print out A. What's nice about NumPy arrays is that when this list is printed out, it's actually formatted like a matrix, unlike a nested list. Now quickly, we can see that NumPy is capable of doing things that Python lists can definitely not do. First, let's see what happens if we try to get row zero in column one. So the same way we did with a list. So that would be A of zero of one. So this works. But conveniently, we can also just use the notation a of zero comma one instead. All right, so this is already better than using lists. But here's where NumPy arrays get very powerful. What if we wanted to select a column of this matrix? Then we can use the colon notation. So let's do a of colon comma zero. All right, so this returns the column at index zero. The colon means select everything in this dimension. So in our case, it means select every row. Here's another example of something NumPy arrays can do that lists can't. If I do a dot t, then we get the transpose of the matrix A. Now here's something interesting. Let's say I want to apply a function to A, like the exponential. Well, it works just like a vector where it applies element-wise. So let's try that. np.expa. And that exponentiates every element. But now, let's try this with a list. 
So np.exp l. So what's interesting about this is NumPy already knows what your list represents and treats it as if it were a NumPy array. In addition, the thing you get back is an actual NumPy array. And you'll find that things work like this all throughout the NumPy stack. So for example, if I want to pass in some data into scikit-learn or matplotlib, it's okay to just pass in a list. There's no need to convert it into a NumPy array first. All right, so let's take a look at some more matrix operations. One of the most fundamental operations is matrix multiplication. So let's suppose I create a new matrix of size two by three. So let's say B equal to np.array of one, two, three, four, five, six. And so, so here's B. Now let's do A multiplied by B. That's A dot B. And you can check this by hand if you want to confirm it's the right answer. Now you might wonder why is it A dot B and not A star B? As you may recall, the star does element wise multiplication which is not the same as matrix multiplication. And as we mentioned earlier, matrix multiplication is a generalization of the dot product. Hence, it makes perfect sense for matrix multiplication to be performed by the dot function. Now, I usually like to emphasize the rule that in matrix multiplication, the inner dimensions must match. So let's see what happens if we break that rule. Let's try to multiply A by B transposed. B transpose has a shape three by two, so this should not be possible. So let's do A dot B transposed. And as expected, we get an error. By the way, you should get familiar with reading these error messages because they'll give you insight into how to debug your code when things get more complicated. So if you ever see this kind of error, you know that you're trying to do some kind of matrix or tensor operation that requires matching dimensions, but whatever you're passing in doesn't match. So let's look at a few more matrix operations. How about the determinant? So that's just np.linalg.det of A. All right, how about the matrix inverse? That's just np.linalg.inv A. And we can check that this is in fact the inverse by multiplying the result by the original. And as you know, we should get back identity. So we do this multiplied by this and we get identity. Now you might wonder what's this funny looking number where we expect to see a zero. Well, we get this because inverting a matrix is an inaccurate operation in a computer. The algorithms that we use to actually compute these operations are not exact. So always be careful when you're using the matrix inverse and think about whether you actually need to do it or if your equation can be simplified. Also, recall that E-16 means times 10 to the power minus 16. So this is in fact very close to zero. By the way, this is also why our determinant is not exactly minus two. There's a four over here. So next, how about the matrix trace? So that's just np.trace of A. And for some reason, this doesn't live in the LinAlge module. So one kind of interesting overloaded function is the diag function. So if we take a matrix, say A, and we call np.diag of A, we get a vector containing the diagonal elements, which is not surprising given the name. But what happens if I call np.diag on a vector? So let's do np.diag of 1, 4. Well, now I get a matrix, which has the input vector on the diagonal and zeros elsewhere. This is, by the way, called a diagonal matrix. 
So just keep in mind that this function is overloaded. If you put in a matrix, you get a vector. And if you put in a vector, you get a matrix. Now, how about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A? So that's just np.linalge.eig of A. Now, you might be wondering, what are all these return values? Assuming you're familiar with eigen decomposition, basically the first return value is an array containing all the eigenvalues, and the second return value is an array containing all the eigenvectors organized into a matrix. Of course, we can use what we know about eigen decomposition to check that these answers are correct. And this will also give us a bit more practice applying what we've learned as well. So let's assign the return values to variables called lam and v. So let's say lam and v is equal to i a. Now, by convention, eigenvectors are stored as column vectors inside v. Luckily, we just looked at how to select columns of a matrix. So let's check whether the zeroth eigenvalue multiplied by the zeroth eigenvector is equal to a times the same eigenvector. So we can do v at column 0 times lambda of 0, so the first eigenvalue, equals equals a at v 0. So interestingly, we get back an array containing one true and one false. This might be surprising to you since equals equals just returns a true or a false. But in fact, like many NumPy operators, this too operates element-wise. Both the left-hand side and right-hand side return a vector of size 2, and therefore we're comparing two vectors of size 2 with the equals equals. Now there's clearly a problem here since by the rules of eigen decomposition, we would expect to see true and true. Well, let's just check the values as a sanity check. So we can take this, and instead of doing equals equals, we can just print the values. Interestingly, the values do look like they are the same, and yet NumPy thinks they are not equal. Of course, this is due to numerical precision. Since computers don't have an infinite amount of memory, they can't have an infinite amount of precision, and therefore numbers have to be rounded off at some point. That's why you'll see terms like 32-bit or 64-bit, which tells you how much space each floating point number takes up. So in NumPy, the correct way to compare whether two arrays are equal is to use the NumPy all close function. So let's try that. So we can do np.allclose, pass in the thing above, And as expected, it returns true. And of course, we could have checked all the eigenvectors at the same time using matrix notation. So that's np.allclose v at np.diag lam and a at v. And we get true as expected. As a final side note for this lecture, if you know that your matrix is symmetric, then you can use the function np.linalge.ih, which is better for that scenario. The H here stands for Hermitian, which is the complex analog of the matrix transpose. It does both a transpose and takes the complex conjugate of the elements. So just so you're aware, NumPy does handle complex numbers if you're doing signal processing or quantum mechanics or something like that. In practice, Usually you'll use eigen decomposition on a symmetric matrix like the covariance. So when that's the case, you should use IH instead, which has the same API.